SoundCloud. Awesome. Yeah, so welcome everyone tonight. Thank you guys for coming on this Saturday, uh, Saturday evening. Um, before we also get started, we do have closed captioning. And if you do need closed captioning, uh, you would, uh, on the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a live transcript option. If you click live transcript and click show or hide subtitles, that should activate uh, the closed captioning uh, in your screen. Um, if you cannot see it, definitely try restarting the Zoom. Uh, you should be able to see it though. Um, so yeah, welcome again, you guys. Uh, this is an artist talk of what's another word for survival, a virtual screening on the Cincinta Previa uh, website. Uh, what's another word for survival is a virtual presentation of video works by artists that submitted to the Cincinta Previa plus Chukimarca Open Call 2020 program uh, that was open earlier this year. Um, this is the last of the two screenings and the last accepted proposal uh, from that open call. Um, each artist in the screening submitted individually and were curatorially weaved together by Jose Luis Benavides. Um, uh, and the open call was juried by Malia Hain Stewart, uh, Jason Mira Diaz, and Santiago X, and supported by the Propeller Fund. Um, a little background of Cincinta Previa, if, you, if, if we're not familiar, uh, Cincinta Previa is a screening and discussion series which archives the polyvocal, multi ethnic, and plural gender experiences, moving images and video artworks of Latinx artists from across the Americas and Caribbean. Uh, Cincinta Previa is programmed by Jose Luis Benavides. Um, my name is John Guevara. I run the Chukimarca uh, project. Uh, Chukimarca is an art library pro project slash proposal tasked to tie in and gather resources related to Native Caribbean and Latin American uh, contemporary art histories and conversation from a Chicago land perspective. <clears throat> um, as Cincinta Previa and Chukimarca work and occupy the Chicago land territory, and as host of tonight's conversation, we want to acknowledge the land and the systems that uphold supremacies in Chicago. Um, we aim to align our tools with work that leads to defunding and eventual abolishment of the Chicago Police Department and redistribution of those funds to social services and community programs. Um, we also want to acknowledge that Chicago is part of the traditional homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Dawa, Ojibwe, and Padawani Nations. Uh, we want to inform the audience that the area east of Michigan Avenue in downtown Chicago is unceded land and violates the standing 1833 Treaty of Chicago with the Dawa, Ojibwe, and Parawabi peoples. Uh, this is because at the time of the 1833 Treaty, that land did not exist. However, not only land, but also water territories were part of the territory agreement. Uh, this is stories from the SettlerColonialCityProject.org. Um, with that introduction, uh, I'm going to pass it over to Jose Luis, who's going to tell us more about how tonight's going to go. Um, and it's going to uh, tell us more about the program, about the arts, which will, uh, will be part of the discussion tonight. Um, so again, thank you guys for coming. I uh, hope you guys are, are engaged uh, as much to your communities. Feel free to use the chat function. Feel free to use the reaction buttons. Uh, we're here to sh share knowledge and exchange conversations. So. Uh, thank you guys for, for coming tonight. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, John, for the great introduction. I'm Jose Luis Benavides, and um, just really grateful to everybody who is here, the participants, the guests, and of course, our, our panelists today. Um, so many of you probably already read the description for the program, and we'll touch base on the actual ideas of the, the curation or the programming, um, the themes throughout the artist's work, but I want to just give a little introduction of the panelists. Uh, we have Lorena Cruz Santiago, Adrian Garcia, and if you mind, maybe just waving um, so people can get familiar with who you are. Your name is probably on your Zoom video. Either way, we have Valeria Montoya, Mateo Vargas, and uh, Martin Wanam. So everybody is from different places, and um, we wanted to run through a couple of just questions and conversations with everyone in the room um, and, and get into the meat of the, you know, the evening. Or if you had a chance to see the videos on Cincinta Previa or you didn't yet, uh, they're all there and they will be for an indeterminate amount of time. So check them out or revisit them if something comes to mind. Um, but uh, I, I do program the series and I'm, I was really excited to just invite everybody to the table today. 
uh, to talk about a, you know, a couple of things that we we're all dealing with the pandemic, um, our relationships to video, uh, our relationship to art making in general, the pol politics of the world, and you know how we're all dealing with with life and and have some fun. Hopefully, it won't be too too serious. Um, but if I can go through that list and maybe have um, just I'll go down the list again, Lorena, Adrian, Valeria, Mateo, and Martin, just tell us where you are right now. What part of the world are you in? Because this is probably one of our most international and national conversations we've had the chance to host in the past year, uh, Chuki Marca and Sintinta Previa together in this effort. Um, but do you want to take it first? Lorena, where are you? Yeah, I'm currently in Detroit, Michigan. And uh, Adrian? I'm currently in Leon, Guanajuato, Mexico. And Valeria? Hello, everyone. I'm in Mexico City. And Mateo? Hello, everyone. I'm also in Mexico City. And Martin? Hi, um, I'm currently in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Yes, we've got two, three people in Mexico right now, two, two in the US, and of course, John and I here in Chicago in the US as well. Uh, so thank you, welcome. Um, a lot of the work was, was made or references other parts of, uh, you know, other homelands like Guatemala and, um, you know, if they weren't made there or in Mexico um, or in the diaspora. Uh, so I wanted to, I can get my notes back, there they are just start the conversation uh, with that acknowledgement of this international you know, discourse that we're having. And, and I'm wondering about, and this is for all of us to discuss, for all of you to discuss, what it was like submitting your work in, in February, almost a year ago, when we were just launching this open call and the, the US was just barely sort of responding to the pandemic. Um, the, the, the continental Americas hadn't really ex uh, had the, the, the impact or the effect of the pandemic in early February, although we were obviously about to. We didn't, none of us knew what was gonna happen, right? Um, so what was it like for all of you submitting your work to this open call then? What were you thinking? What were you feeling? What was going on in the world right be before this, before all of our lives were put on pause? Anyone can take that. I can start. I was actually, um, I was doing a residency in Oaxaca in March. And so I got to Oaxaca and, and spent like one peaceful week there. And then the second week was just kind of hell of all of us trying to decide what to do because we were like also an international group with people from Canada and from Australia. Um, and so I actually, I, I think I saw the open call early on, but I didn't submit until May. And, um, you know, I, f I felt kind of okay submitting in May because I still had some amount of momentum and, you know, no one really had any idea that um, by December we would still be in a situation. Anyone else? I can go. Um, I actually had one of my sisters studying abroad in China at the time of the wow. actual outbreak. So I had that kind of stress anxiety situation going on pretty early. Um, but yeah, like submitting work at that time kind of felt a little frantic or like dread induced. Um, I just had a feeling that the government, the US government at least was not gonna handle any kind of spread very well. Um, and another side note, my, my mom was, is working at a nursing home in Texas and at this point, she's now in contact with COVID patients daily. So it's kind of like, at that, at that point in time, a lot of like anxiety, dread kind of feeling. <clears throat> and still, I mean, we're not, we're not over it. Um, that's fascinating to imagine that you, were, you had connections to, you know, the other side of the world that was already kind of already in full swing or getting the full hit of the pandemic. I had a friend who who was working for some kind of international agency and, and they, were, they were watching their offices close like in slow time, in you know, slow motion across the, across the globe 
as it slowly made its way to, 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 to Europe and you know us over here. Um, and the idea of being in the middle of an artist residency with all of the, well, the uncertainty that that would bring is, is really hard. How about anyone else? Do you wanna talk about that or, or um, just talk about you know, the work that you submitted and, and the feelings of submitting your work too? I, I heard about the, um, the open call, thanks to Ana Garcia, who's in the, who's hearing us. And I think that for me, it was like just an opportunity to reach out again to Chicago because I, I was like already here in Mexico and I wanted to, to keep in touch with um, the art community there. And it was interesting for me, I was also, um, starting teaching here and I, I, I remember to to talk to, to to my students about the pandemic a lot when it was like starting to to become a serious issue and I remember that I said something like uh, it's going to hit us hard and and I didn't know how hard it was but that time, but uh, it was interesting to to look at it like just spreading, like in real time. I mean, just interesting because it's been a pain in the ass for all of us on different levels as teachers or students or artists. It's really it's been really hard. Um, anyone else want to take the question before we maybe just move on? I can go. Um, I think that um, to me was like, I made the work on early January of this year. And then that was part of my thesis show, which was in the, well, in the US or at least in Albuquerque was my show of the thesis show. Um, the last day was a day before, uh, like kind of like everything got into shutdown. Um, so it was really interesting because I did got to show my performance in like a gallery space where like people came in to see it. Um, but ultimately, I think I, you know, I submitted in terms of like kind of continuing my practice and how like, you know, it continuing the engagement and prior to like completing my MFA as well, like in this um, spring, um, that was kind of it. And like, you know, continue just trying to like, you know, um, get the work out there. It's a, it's a vulnerable state to be in not, without an, a pandemic. It's really difficult to, to send work. Um, I think everybody responded. Valeria, did you want to mention anything about that? Um, during that time, I think I submitted because as, um, as Martin said, like I was trying to continue with my, you know, like engagement um, and my practice. Um, the pieces that are shown in the video, the sculptures, were part of an exhibition last November as a um, landscape Biennale in Sonora. So the video came out out of those um, pieces. So I was trying to engage into more screenings or more places that this medium were like able to fit in. So I was just looking in, in the house for open calls to engage. And we thank you. Actually, now thinking about um, the fact that you went right after um, Martin, your both of your works uh, engage specific locales, specific sites on a map that are that are that might be interesting to to talk about. And it doesn't have to be now. Maybe if it comes up later, or if you want to talk about those the, the places that you were in to record the work, um, your relationship to them, or how interesting they are. Um, but you know, in general. The, the fact that everybody was kind of dealing with this trauma at, at that time and then through to, to the end of our submission call, which you're reminding me, I guess, was in May. Um, the, the idea that, that, and the question is about dealing with this trauma that's ongoing. We haven't, we haven't finished the pandemic. Uh, you know, we don't know when the end is, is coming. And how, how have you all been coping with this ongoing trauma? Are we okay? Are we still processing? Are we, are we making, how are we making uh, work these days? Is, um, 
you know, are we able to, to actually heal yet? Or are we still, you know, is, it's an open question, right? Um, how, do you, how do you all feel now that we're pretending that things are normal? Well, today in Mexico City, we actually start the second um, lockdown, quote to quote, because it has never been that strict as in comparison with other parts of the world. Um, I don't know if I feel trauma or anything. Maybe that's a symptom of trauma. Uh, I'm not so sure. But, um, but I would say that for me, during this period of time of like just being in lockdown on and off, I got the chance to engage to many other art practitioners and and institutions and self-run places around the globe. So it has been very prolific in a way. But on the other hand, um, yeah, like the screens and the video and the technology has been always there, right? So it's, it's kind of, it feels kind of like not real in the sense that you're not physically in every, you know, like talk or show or event, our event, it doesn't feel the same way. But on the other hand, I would say that, yeah, I've been engaging with a lot of art practitioners and places. So it's been, it's been nice in a way. I mean, I can go so we can go vice versa. <laughs> but I think that, I mean, my practice, um, took like a little bit of a pause, like my general like uh, art practice, um, which I'm slowly getting there again. Like I feel like to me is like the key word is resistance and how, you know, the pandemic kind of came to amplify problems already existing, right? And mostly I'm focused back home, like how Guatemala, like there's so many different issues and like the pandemic kind of like expand those problems into healthcare, into economics, into just like regular society. Um, and then also my practice kind of shift into working within a collective with Fronterices Collective and in, in kind of like focus into immigration, but also specifically um, the prison industrial complex and how like we can find other, um, you know, strategies and creative strategies to kind of like um, amplify the movement, right? Like creating cl uh, collisions, but also how we use social media or billboards or other means that we can, um, create more awareness, but also like how we give information to folks that might not be um, in a gallery space, right? Prior to a pandemic, but how now people that might always go to a gallery, how they're engaging with art, how can we switch into different platforms that, you know, the internet is one platform, right? Social media is another platform. How can we create other things? Um, so I think to me, it's been like um, resisting. And like, I think that's just like a general, like, um, way that my practice is always um just kind of reacting to social political systems and um i think that even though my practice kind of like shift a little bit it's always been like about like you know um resisting and like um activating through specific movements anyone else want to take the question about uh like coping with the pandemic and and where your work is that? Let me unmute myself. Um, yeah, I think uh, I've, I've personally felt like really uninspired by it. I think like seeing all the, you know, the social unrest that's that's always been there be like the, the front, the front page news on a lot of our Instagram feeds has like, um, made me question like the the art world in general more than I already did and so um I think for me like my my hope when my hope for when I finally start making work again is that it's like work that's coming from a place that's not looking for the approval or the um like the what's the word um or I mean I guess approval is really just the word like something that's not looking for the approval of like the current powers that be and that's like really specifically talking about the art world um so it's spaces like these that we have right now that become really important um for me that reminds me of um what Valeria was saying too about these international kind of communities and conversations that we're all 
being able to be a part of now with with the advent of Zoom. But it was aptly said we had the technology for a long time before. Um, I think I've even been on Zoom talking about that. Like why why weren't the institutions doing this before? You know, why did it take a pandemic for us to actually use uh, you know virtuality as a thing? Um, so, but I'm glad that we're all connected, you know, now and here with this. Um, I'm going to shift the, the, the conversation or the question just a little bit um, towards the actual chunk of the work or the, the, the meat of, of your all works. What, um, <clears throat> how are we coping individually, collectively, you know, spiritually? How are we maintaining a sustainable practice? Um, and what language do we have? Uh, to to continue our, our practice and our work with all the certain the circumstances that they are um, and and specifically to touch on a couple of uh, your your works you know there's uh, through lines of indigeneity of spirituality of the body and performance um, through through a lot of the works here that provide um, different strategies um, if you all what might just jump in when you feel um, regarding, you know, your your practice and how those working in those different modes um, offer up, you know, possibilities. Um, I think I, I've definitely been been focusing a lot on indigeneity um, and specifically how language within my video can can provide some kind of uh, an anchor for connecting to a pat like a, a ancient culture basically but also um like thinking about indigeneity not just in the past but also like as a way to remind people that it's something that is very much present today and that will be present in the future so for me that's kind of been like the driving force um for a lot of my like my thought process before I start making things again um, for like the last couple of months. I, I want to say something that I, I thought when uh, we were starting the conversation regarding Lorena's work, uh, because um, when we were seeing this papel picado, like glitching with the Banda video, uh, I thought that it was incredibly, like incredibly, and nowadays, Thing because of the backgrounds we use in Zoom, and that they tend to glitch the image that we are looking at from other people. Like when, when John was like showing us a, a cup of, of water or wine, I don't know, what are you drinking, uh, that it, it disappeared and also your hand. So I think that it's a, I don't know if you thought about that like beforehand, but it's like, it's like very today <laughs> to think about that and to, to make something like that. And I think that, that that was like very interesting to me to think like just about that work, but also the, the Braith uh, video that, that is up, up in the website. I think that's a very interesting thing, like glitching like with this idea of indigeneity. And I think that it's a very nice uh, work Thank you. I mean, I could, I could talk about um, mine, specifically talking about performance and how, um, to me, performance was like a means of moving out of the institution and reaching different um, individuals. Like how, I mean, I was having a formal education in like in an MFA, right? But like ultimately who were going to gallery spaces, right? Not only in the US, but also back home, like who had access to that, right? Um, and performance to me was like this idea of having access to other individuals and how they would interact with something they might not fully understand, but I was like confronting them with something that might be uncomfortable or how I might feel uncomfortable into getting this information out there, right? Um, and to me, it's just the thought process of like how, how different is to engage in a gallery space, like who and what other folks go and interacting with individuals just in the street, right? 
Um, and I think it was like a tool that I used to reach other individuals and individuals in my community specifically. Mateo, you've been suspiciously quiet. Uh, <laughs> how, how do you respond to the idea, maybe not just of performance, but uh, in your work, but also um, your engagement with the camera and the engagement with virtuality with that, um, that kind of automated voice that's working as kind of the, as I saw your video as kind of the prelude for, for the statement of the work. Um, yeah, so for that video specifically, I mean, I think in a lot of the videos I make, I try to tie things to the elements. So like the idea of, like the question of sustainability is interesting to me in the world we're living in, especially um, with the kind of capitalistic system we're in. Um, so in that video, it actually, the idea occurred to me to cook the letter, like as if it was a meal, um, this like vanity letter from Trump um and how that's that check sending thing was very like unsustainable for a lot of people um i think i ended up getting a check like months before my mom got a check who has like other kids that live with her so i just thought it was interesting that like it was such a sporadic um thing but like tying the fire <clears throat> fire is something elemental that you know, is essential to human survival, um, but pairing it with this very robotic, like non-essential um, letter that is supposed to be like touting, this is to help you um, survive. <clears throat> and it doesn't last very long. It's not even, I don't know, it's not sustainable. And the idea of the element of sunlight in the other video is also like slowly watching um <clears throat> sun setting or rising it depends i guess on how you want to watch it um and how that is also like a necessity and like it's not sustainable to be incarcerating children separating children running a whole industry off of um dehumanizing people um like these systems are collapsible um i'm actually working on a new project right now with the element of water specifically. Um, it's, it's about pollution, contamination, and kind of like contrasting what natural resources we have right now, um, and like how we've kind of like gone askew. Um, so yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. Those are some really, I mean, those are details in the work that we've been talking for two months now to prepare for this that I didn't even pick up on or know we're, we're in the work. So thank you for, for sharing that really important perspective on like your backstory. Um, and feel free, everybody, if there's these backstories, these elements of the work, you know, like we talked about two of the locations for, for Valeria and Martin, we haven't discussed yet or other elements in the work that you, you know, are part of the process of making, feel free to, to shout them out um, as we continue talking. Uh, thank you. But um, you do bring up the, the issue of uh, the incarceration of youth and the, the, the deportations and detainment of families. Uh, so, and Martin also talks about this you know, political sort of charge um, in the work. How do we all feel? What are our thoughts on, on immigration justice and movements and, and where are things at right now for our immigrant populations? Um, and, and how are we how are you if you do see yourselves as political artists or protest artists engaging these topics? Yeah, I mean, I, I could speak a little bit about my work and how to me is like, ironically, I mean, I am an immigrant in like in the US and at the moment it also, of course I'm not, I mean, this like quick sand that, you know, uncertainty of like, I'm gonna be here or I'm gonna go back home. But what it strikes me the most in terms of being more political and, you know, resistant in my work is the idea that a lot of individuals in the U.S. don't understand like migration is a result of imperialism and how the U.S. specifically has, you know, done so much harm into our communities that that's the reason that people are leaving because they need opportunities. They, they're engaging with different um, issues, right? Either 
um, climate disasters or just like, for instance, let's look at the United Fruit Company, how uh, many, many years still, and it is still affecting. And a lot of people just think like, you know, they're coming for here to just extract things, but they don't look at how resources that the US has is because of all of our countries in Latin America, right? Um, so I think it's really important to have those conversations and sometimes it's just inform, right? Because ultimately history is told by the people that are more convenient to, right? And like, which side are we hearing? Um, so I think it's really important that to me, I feel like our work has to have a political stand. Like it doesn't really matter um, if you, um, you know, you do something apolitical or something like that, it always has a political stand because you come from a perspective, like I come from a perspective of, you know, Guatemalan, queer, brown, and that's where my work kind of relates to uh, the spora and like to everything that I do. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Adrian, your work is um, engaging animation to, to bring up these topics. And it's not a thing that I, that I think maybe people would normally connect uh, this kind of, uh, this form of animation as a light or even sometimes childish kind of medium for, for, the, for the young person, you know, for, for kids to watch cartoons, uh, but to employ animation in a conversation about something so, so you know, heavy and big as the, the border and immigration, um, do, what what does animation provide as a as a tool for is for resistance or do you, did you see it as resistance as political what what were you thinking while making the work? Uh, well, I, I'm going to start to say that uh, this work started as a collaboration. Um, actually, some of the excerpts are in a in a documentary by Cecilia Cornejo. Um, a uh, Chilean filmmaker, uh, she lives in Northfield, Minnesota. And she asked me to make this like little pieces of animation to, to be spread out uh, throughout the, the film. And at the beginning, I, I, didn't, I didn't know how to work them. I guess actually, I was like just procrastinating for a little while. Uh, we were procrastinating because uh, Cecilia didn't want me to jumped into the work without actually meeting with the people that were going to work and be in front of the cameras. Uh, they were the, they are the community of, a, well, a very huge community of Mexican immigrants living in Northfield. And coincidentally, they are all from, or most, mostly from Maltrata, Veracruz. Uh, and and I, I, I met them a couple of years ago, and only when I met them, I started to work in the animation. And what Cecilia and I like discussed was that we, we didn't want the, the video to be like, let's say, like something for people to feel bad about them. It's more about making clear that they are already part of the community there in Northfield and therefore uh, America as a country. And so, so I, I started to think about these pieces of animation as if they were like some sort of bad dream of someone that is traveling through the desert uh, because actually that was the, the, the the literature that Cecilia suggested me to read beforehand. Uh, and I was reading this couple of books about the crossing. One of them was like creative nonfiction. The other one was like a more uh, like anthropological approach. So they were like very, very vivid. Uh, I, I, I would say that, yeah. And, and, and that, that those readings were the, the main focus for me. So we didn't want something to, to, to make people feel sorry for them. And we didn't want all neither to like, to make something that was like, I don't know how to say that. Maybe we didn't anything to be like, 
awful on purpose. <laughs> so uh, because I, I I wanted because I really like animation. I think that it's a very versatile medium to say things that can even go like under noticed for people that it's not aware of these things. And as you said, uh, it's, it's a very child childish medium. And I think that's both like an advantage and also can be a, a very harmful thing for the, for the medium. Uh, it's all, 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 always people saying that it's for, for children, but no, I actually, I think that because of that ambiguity, I think that it's a very useful medium to say things that people don't want to, to see. It provides um, sort of like a freeing of the minds. It lets your imagination run, run in ways that you were talking about speak things that you can't say or undertones of things that, that um, yeah, are, are restrictive when you're limited to the body, when you're limited to the person in front of the, the camera, when you're limited to performance in that way, or even the voice of, of someone speaking. Uh, but that does open up the, the conversation for, for those that do have the, you know, their body's presence in the work uh, Valeria, Lorena, uh, Mateo, Martin, you're, it's talking about it in a completely different way. You're, you know, for at least two of you, Mateo and Martin, engaging specifically the topics of, of immigration um, or colonial subjects and bodies. And, and then also for Valeria, engaging in, in this performance and, and connect, reconnection with the self. Uh, what do you all think about performance? specifically in front of the camera and then also we can just open that up to today you know we're all right now on zoom performing for the camera how where are we at <laughs> with ourselves in the camera i think that can be like uh extended to not just like the the video platforms but also like social media and um I, like I think my my like do did you piece where I'm crying um is kind of like where I'm at with like the rest of social media where it's like you know I don't want to like try and perform that like I'm still having fun <laughs> like in real life um and so it's like this like almost exhaustion of like um we've used social media for so long as like a way to perform like a, a happy or like perfect life that it's like, okay, I'm past that point. And um, me, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure if that I was really going anywhere with that, but um, as far as like subjectivity goes with like within the, the work that I did submit, um, it's like, it's a, it, I don't know, it's a good tool for me to be able to like speak on that subjectivity of like under colonialism and uh, similar powers of that. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think it's a, like a tool that's very liberating, like performance to be used as like critique. Like I think Martin's video is like perfect example of this, just seeing like, flipping context, flipping like ritual kind of like watching Martin eat the baby Jesus. Um, I just had a lot of like thoughts about, um, you know, the ritual of communion, Catholicism in Latin America and just like in that setting, in that space, you really just examine like the different layers of um, colonialism and religious kind of like um, op oppression. Um, it's, it's a very like, I think a very powerful tool of um, using performance in that way. That's something that's not just like a happy positive thing. It's definitely a pointed um, commentary. <clears throat> Martin, thoughts about performance, the video, the camera? <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know. I think that um, I think that I use the 
the camera more so as documentation than anything else. Um, specifically in that video was to me um, a documentation. Um, but I see it as a tool, yeah. Like, I mean, I'm in front of like um, the cathedral that it's just the center point of the city um, where also the national palace is, right? And how could I critique this coloniality in terms of Christianity, right? And how as a queer subject, they feed us this information that we should just follow because that's what it is. And uh, I just kind of like took this, um, you know, this why Jesus that I cast it in chocolate and just started like eating and eating and then just like spitting out just kind of like a way of not only healing but also a way of um how could I also physically do something that put me into that spot right that creates that that resistance on me in Catholicism right because my family is fairly Catholic and it's always about like all this like gestural things and like um language is also I think part of it um just like little things like you know um you cannot be doing this because God doesn't say so um and I think that to me was a physical reaction to how you know how much can I endure eating this baby to totally deconstruct it instead of like swallowing and just being encrypted on me I was trying to like just put it in my mouth and then spit it as a way of rejection not only a way of Catholicism but also a way of whiteness right I mean how we're feeding whiteness into us right I mean as a brown kid I was always like look into whiteness like as a pedestal like I wanted to be white right but where is this whiteness coming from right I mean it's not just only reinforced by society but like religion has a lot to do with that whiteness uh, most of our saints are like white um their blue eye um and all this like information that is just like fit into us and it's been encrypted in in a way because even though being actively trying to um create those decolonial gestures, I feel that I caught myself like thinking or just like saying little things like, um, I don't know, we say like, um, oh, the or like, uh, I don't know, little like slang that slips into us. And I'm like, why am I saying this? Um, or like, gracias a Dios, like everything is like, gracias a Dios. But it's just things that not really, um, but yeah, that's the way that I engage with it. <laughs> I was just translating in the in the chat for anyone who wanted to know what gracias a Dios means. It's just like thank God or thanks God uh, for anyone who doesn't speak Spanish. Um, but yeah, it's a part of everything, totally. Language. Um, I'm really interested in this idea of the of yeah, what what strategies we have of de, you know decolonizing our minds, the body, uh, the land, the actual places that you know, have been colonized, uh, but um, Valeria, you haven't really said anything about the location or, or the work and the video and, and its meanings um, and what this performance was. And, and maybe we can loop it back to the conversation about, about video and the screen. Um, I know that you have a lot of thoughts and feelings about, how, you know, what we're doing <laughs> and what your sculptural performance was, was doing and saying um yeah like my approach to performance was has been always mediated by like embodiment mostly so um, i wouldn't say or i wouldn't call myself a performance artist because i'm way too shy to actual like perform a durational performance or to go to an extreme where I put myself into a situation where I feel uncomfortable. So for most of my practice is mostly about like embodied art practices or embodied embodiment basically. And so what I try to do and most of the times what I'm what I use is walk as a tool to think about embodiment. Um, so in a way in this piece what I was trying to do was to document those sculptures that were also trying to think about images um, that aren't mediated by screens and that's why I use um, mirrors most of the time so I was thinking about like moving images in corporeal motion while walking and that also connects in a way with other questions that I've been exploring as part of my practice that has to do with uh, your human walking 
Um, three years ago, I got into, well, the Caravana Migrante of, of Honduras were crossing Mexico City. So that was a great input into, like, I don't know if it was a great input, but that was sh shocking for me. So that made me thought about how uh, while well, thinking landscape and territory embodiment was also uh, relevant um, corporeal tool and also a statement that can be, you know, like you, you can make presence by walking and crossing a territory. Um, so, yeah, I would say that video most of the times for me also helped me to rethink those ideas about embodiment and how to see, ironically, with other parts of the body that is also relevant for me. But I wouldn't call myself a performance artist. I have never been, had the courage or I've never been brave enough to call myself a performance artist. <laughs> I'm way too shy, I'm way too shy to, yeah. <laughs> But I love what you said about the seeing with other parts of the body, um, I, and I wonder what the what those what the I, the intention is or what the effect is and what the reflection now on the work with all of these screens that we're and all of these moving images that we're all experiencing each other through. What ref, you know what you might have to say or what opinions or thoughts or observations you have about these screens that are ever these mediated images that we're all engaging. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis now, what what new reading you might have given from a work that was started from another place to now the actual sculptures and, and seeing you read these reflections in them? Um, well, I'm not sure about like how video actually has like an input because at the end it's an audio visual, right? And it, video, it's also really connected to the um, to the way that we communicate each other nowadays, mostly digitally. Um, but in a way, I do feel that trying to see with other parts that are in that optic center will help to develop other strategies to rethink our own embodiment and our own like optics. So in a way that helped me also to make not this piece particularly, but other pieces that are that are related to moving images in the sense that you can, you know, like develop a sensorial or somatic perspective that can be translated into a camera because at the end when you move, either you perform for a camera or you, or you are like, like right now we're in front of this eye and we are transmitting ourselves live um, that kind of like help to rethink other ways to maybe just talk or see things. I don't know if I'm explaining myself correctly, but yeah, it's about <laughs> it's, it, there are many there are many topics I guess in the way that are crossing this this particular piece and many questions that I've been wondering about. Yeah, about how to read video things. through video. Ironically, through video because at the end, I mean, ultimately, video is just audio visual, so. It's hard not to go back to the eye, right? Hmm. Yeah, it is hard not. To, we depend on it so much, and and it's too much. Maybe a part of what our whole world is revolves around. And and so I appreciate that your your work is kind of questioning that. But also, there's there's a strange thing that happens with your video in that it also has a spiritual response. Like I see the work as very like a a witchy kind of magical performance that's happening in, unintentionally or intentionally that that does connect back in some ways pot potentially to the you know these forms of resistance to colonial powers and structures that uh that deem the witch as as a negative as a bad thing or deem indigeneity as as a bad or negative thing right um and that might open it up back to our initial conversation like what for everyone, what systems and powers are you, you know, potentially actively speaking to and resisting? Um, uh, Lorena mentioned, you know, colonialism. It's also present in Martin's work. Um, actual governments and bodies are are in um, Mateo and and Adrian's work. But I would rather you all speak to what your what's 
the spiritual tone or engagement or resistance that you're all working for or against? If that made any sense? I think um, something that I've been considering a lot and like speaking to friends about uh, is like the idea of work. Um, shout out to Chris because he's here right now and I talk to him about this a lot, but um, you know, like the idea of like the evolution of the 40 hour work week and how that itself is like the product of a capitalist system. And um, for me, like my practice uh, is trying to evolve out of that in a, in a way. And like um, a lot of that has to do with like providing grace for yourself of outside of like being productive. Um, so, you know, I think I've, I've already said a few times that I'm not making anything right now, but um, trying to get to that space where the work, um, the work is not so much about making it, but more about like the, what goes on when you're not working, I guess, and how like that in itself, uh, the idea of not focusing so much on like productivity and work um, is a way of like healing yourself from, like healing yourself from a capitalist system that will always make you feel unwhole or make you feel like you're not enough. I think that uh, that about the work was like very interesting. I, I myself, I haven't been working a lot, like obviously like teaching and that stuff that uh, I have to do because I have to eat, it's like uh, unescapable. But uh, for my practice, I haven't done so much like during this uh, pandemic times. Uh, and not because I don't want to, just because I think that at the, at the very beginning, I, I was planning a lot of things and I was like forcing myself to do things maybe in that, um, in that sense that I, I wanted that time to be productive. Uh, but then I just started to think and to read and to watch things and listen to music. And I think that, that that's been very good for me uh, in some times that unfortunately are very often uh, now uh, because of like pandemic anxiety and stuff like that, um, that I feel relief when I don't work and I just like go into things that, that are important for me, whether it's reading or, or just watching a movie or whatever. I think that, that that's also kind of building up to something sometime in the future, I don't know when, and I, I care less and less with time, uh, whether I'm gonna do it or not, because I think that just like thinking about that is it's enough to, to make, make things happen eventually. I think that I, I really like um, Lorena's comment in terms of like, you know, um how we always feel not enough and it makes me think about how i'm i mean I, i've mentioned before that i was reading like the sense of brown and it, they're part of the book of Jose Dan Muñoz talks about like how brownness is always described as trouble and that's how we are perceived in this like you know white system right and i feel like that's what in my own practice that what that's what i fight for right i mean i fight for you know quality especially in like being queer and being brown and being latino and how uh most of my work kind of speaks to those like you know structures those power structures either by coloniality or whiteness which you know they're kind of intersex um between each other um but i feel that is that you know and i always think as my practice even fighting with the structures, I always try to see this queer utopia, right? And even though it's it's an utopia, right? I mean, it's, it's in the horizon, we cannot achieve it. And once we achieve that horizon, other arises. Um, I think that, um, yeah, I think that we need to be outspoken. We have to be political and mostly in countries as ours, right? I mean, we are predominantly here in like Mexico and Guatemala diaspora, but um, back home, 
having an opinion specifically in politics, um, it's been crazy. Like you are crazy. Like why are you having opinions on this? And I think that that's something that I've, I've learned through my practice is how uh, my practice speaks visually to these issues to create conversations, to um, not be silenced, to just at least have a conversation or question yourself because we're raised not to, um, to have critical thinking. We're raised to believe this is what it is and, and period. Um, so in terms of that, I think that, yeah, I think that my practice kind of um, engages when like those prior structures that keep us oppressed, specifically communities of color. I want to say that uh, by responding to that, like uh, I was like, I didn't know that my work was political until I went to study to, to the US to Chicago and, and start to, to, to feel like what it was like to be a brown person and a Latino in, in the United States. Uh, because when I was like applying for, you know, to get like my social security number and all that stuff, uh, it, it was like very shocking to me, like to see all the, those like checkbooks where you have to like to state your identity uh, and it was like very, I don't know, it, I thought that it was absurd, that thing, it was like useless. I, 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 I really, I can't articulate what was happening with me in that time. I was just doing that because I had to work and I was, I, I need to work. So I just put, well, there was a checkbox with, I don't want to state this. So it, that, that was like my, my answer to that because I think that those, those labels are very unrealistic. Like I'm not just a Latino, I'm not just Mexican. I'm, just, I'm not just like a brown person. It was like very like limiting for me just to, to, to think about me in those terms. And, and just because of that, I started to think that my work could be political. And I don't know if this film in particular is like obviously political. For me it is because it's like, like a new thing for me to do. It was a new thing when I was doing it. Um, but I, I, I do agree that we need to engage in that in those conversations because especially in countries like ours uh, because they are like I don't know they are like so numb that they don't feel anything that people is like uh, stepping on ourselves every time like and people don't do anything I think that the like Mexico and the U.S. had like social uprisings like just starting the pandemic and I think that that speaks a lot about that we need to to speak out loud about what what's wrong with these systems that we are living in I don't know sorry as a follow-up question like I found really interesting what you mentioned because I I also started looking at a lot of my work like moving through the U.S. I mean I, I came to the U.S. to create my to acquire an MFA. And it is really interesting to me, what I found was this um, information that was being kept from us, um, like information that the US kind of have and, and like our countries don't, or at least that's was my experience was like this idea that I had not access to information, specifically don't understanding why people were treating me the way that I was being treated regardless in the US or being back home. And I only acquired that information being in the US, which is, ironically right I mean because they, I don't know to me it's just like the conclusion of like I agree with you like how those categories are ridiculous to be classified as um but then yet again it does matter because we are being subjected to them and we're being treated differently because of those right um and we don't understand them until we like really acquire that information why is this coming from through our history through um who is in power still right and it is to me sad to like have been able to learn all that information just 
coming to the US, right? And like how back home, we don't have that information. And like, that's how a lot of the control comes from, right? I mean, keeping ignorant, like not understanding all those things. And through learning, it's, it's, you know, and I don't know how other feels in terms of like, you know, information, but that was my experience like coming through the US. Um, yeah, I don't know, but I'm really interested to hear what other, other folks think about that. Can I introduce here? <laughs> uh, I love this conversation because it's not until like uh, Mexican born or, or Guatemalan born, like, like you're saying, Martin, don't understand why here in the US we're so uh, responsive to be politically engaged uh, when it comes to the identity work that, that we do here. So I really enjoy this conversation that you, you, you can't grasp the amount of ignorance that we, we have here. Um, Oh, the amount of information we have here being uh, being withheld to to different communities for the same reason to control them, right? So, uh, yeah, I just just thank you for 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 underlining that, and it, it does take unfortunately to change your your site uh, of study or or your your physical um, land to 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 engage in those conversations and to start thinking what that land starts to think because. Uh, a lot of the times uh, talking to international artists who come to the United States, they kind of have to go through this kind of uh, transition of uh, like, oh, I'm Latino and why, you know, the kind of like this, the racism that that's inherent now, I don't want to say inherent, but like what is inherent to interact with institutions uh, that isn't understood until you get here in the United States, right? Um, and that's speaking for like uh, one on the international side, right? Uh, but for us who are born here, Latinos who are born here, Latinx, uh, part of the diaspora, we knew it since the get, right? So I think what, what I propose a, as a task for all of us uh, within the discourse of being Latinx uh, makers, um, if, you, if you choose to define yourself like that, or um, if, you, if, if you're part of just the, America, the, the project that is colonization of, the, of this side of the, of the world um, in this big continent uh, of the Americas, what I propose to ta task ourselves is to really um, feel with the land that, that we're communicating with uh, and to have these conversations more openly because just to accelerate this transitions, right? So at the end of the day, what we're doing is exchanging this information, reaching for each other's knowledges, uh, more so, uh, more more so to just reach, more so to just exchange that 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 experience of transitioning to a different land, because um, half the time, uh, speaking to the it, the it it is a process to go through this shock. And what I propose as makers is definitely to just like keep in touch uh, or, or reach to to other diasporas uh, who already kind of could like speed it up, right? Speed up the conversation, accelerate it. Not to not 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 in the sense of like we're just trying to get over it, but in the sense that our task is other. Because this in itself, the hurdle of just ex the hurdle of just giving language to the experience of migration uh, is in itself. Uh, a strategy of white supremacy to to maintain us uh, uh, ignorant. So what I propose as a task for all of us is definitely just to have these conversations to to actually, um, which with the internet, with the screens that we're on, with the Zoom, it is super helpful as a tool right now to do this. Right, like no one's in Chicago right now. It's just me and Jose Luis in Chicago who starts these conversations here uh, in Chicago. But like respectfully, each one to his own in Mexico and Detroit in. In New Mexico, etc., it, it is definitely uh, one of an opportunity or an example of how we could be reaching a, and underlining that experience, right? And then to, after underlining the experience and uh, and giving language to it, then actually figure out what the actual work is to do um, apart from that. And you can't really have those engagements with uh, white heteronormative uh, folks in the art world. Uh, and I don't want to say IE institution, but yeah, IE institution where all our instructors are white, right? So um, that's my little bit uh, on what what's being response to right now. Um, 
I just yeah. affirmed. I just affirmed you in the chat, John, that it is. You 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 backtrack that it's not inherent to the institutions, the race that the you know the white supremacy and the racism. But it is. We could just say that it is. <laughs> like you just said it again. But it is. It's okay. We're not gonna get in trouble. The institution is not gonna come get us. <laughs> like, but um, I, I appreciate what everybody is kind of saying, and I want to tie it back to some of the ag the, the work that we were looking at for the the program, specifically Valeria's um, connection to the ground and to earth in walking. And also, Mateo, your engagement with um, now that I know uh, elemental, you know, fire, earth, wind, these uh, these properties, the performative, and then in them, and the you know the the potential, the potentials in them, as as powerful elements um, that can reconnect us to the land, and also of course um, Lorena's work uh, in, in dealing with language and indigeneity, and 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 our you know our, your identity and the self as it's connected to all of these things. Um, I don't know if that's an invitation for you three to maybe say something or not. I, maybe I just said it. <laughs> if you wanna say something, <laughs> feel free to jump in. Well, um, kind of expanding on what John was talking about and what everyone else was mentioning, it really made me think about The Undercommons by Fred Moten and Steve Harney, or Steve, yeah, I think it's Steve Harney. Um, and like how um, it made me think of, of that that reading and then also of like just being a child of immigrants and like having to literally translate everything for your parents um but there's like that idea of um you know like where we're challenged with this with existing in these systems so then within existing that existing in those systems we're also creating and like um producing our own spaces. And so like within the under commons, what like Fred Mountain and Steve Harney speak about a lot is like the idea of study and how they kind of expand on study beyond it being like an academic setting. So study can be anything that anyone is doing that's like them gathering together. So um, yeah, I, I, I just really enjoyed that, the conversation that we had because another thing that like Jack Halperstam writes about in the intro to the under Commons is this idea of like Fred Moen and Steve Harney wanting to, or like kind of citing Frantz Fanon and like Frantz Fanon's desire to speak like the, um, the crazy nonsensical language of, of like colonialism as like a tool against colonialism. So um, yeah, I think I see that in a lot of everyone's work of us just kind of, um, having this like crazy nonsensical reaction to the systems that we've been facing. But thank you for none of you responding adequately to the charge of colonialism. We don't want to respond as colonialism wants us to, right? We, in this nonsense making or this translation or these, uh, I love everything that you said also because I adore Jack Hepperstein's work. Um, the queer art of failure is like my birth as an artist. <laughs> Just understanding that book is literally everything. <laughs> um, um, I haven't read everything that Jack's done, but I, and I want to read this now. So <laughs> thank you for putting me onto that text. But um, yeah, we're everybody's responding in a different way to different things. So maybe Mateo or Valeria or anyone else who wants to jump in, feel free. And also, we're getting new guests. Welcome. A little late to the party, but that's okay. The party's still going. Would, would this be a time where we could open up to questions? Or I don't know if you have any more questions, Jose Luis, uh, but if, if anyone has any uh, questions for the artist, uh, for each individual video, uh, feel free to put it on the chat, or if you want to unmute yourself, um, if you want to talk, just you know, definitely raise your hand or or or, or whichever way you, you want to do, feel free to feel free to do it now. Um, I'm enjoying this conversation, definitely. Um, but yeah, um, I think uh, there's been a question in there. The, the last thing that we kind of hadn't talked touched on as a topic, um, which was kind of engaged by by this question of the screens and um, you know, we were all talking about before our engagements with social media. But I was a little tired of social media. Of course, I am too. <laughs> but um, 
it might be a I don't know an awkward transition in back from decolonial perspectives and learning and and resisting language and and all these different bigger topics to, to switch gears and talk about how how we're all doing with TikTok and how we're all dealing with with the digital world in that silly but also important and potentially politically viable uh, and charged. Uh, we had some examples floating around. I don't know if people want to jump in and talk about that TikTok screen top topic. It was something that we had on the docket. Maybe this is not the natural fit for it right now, but or we can jump into the questions from the audience, whatever. Um, I could talk a little bit about TikTok. I think there's like so many different things that we can like gather from it. Um, but one of my favorite things was like uh, early, like last week we were having a, <laughs> uh, last week we were having a discussion, just like um, a Zoom discussion together. And Jose Luis was like, I don't think I could, you know, I, I know nothing really about creating videos. And Jose Luis said like, I just know how to like cut and edit. And I was like, well, Jose Luis, like that's kind of all you need to know to like create a TikTok and like make things on TikTok. But um, I think that like TikTok has created like a really incredible like resource for a lot of people. Um, I think maybe there's like, there could be like a, a, a conversation about like the value of video art in like a TikTok generation. But like, I think each of them like I think our video art has like a lot of value that like um, that you can also find in TikTok. Um, but like for me, it's become like a really great like educational tool and like how like um, I think like my favorite diss about like millennials is that we post still content versus like Gen Z posting like this like moving image, um, moving image basically. And um, I don't know, I think like the rise of TikTok, TikTok is really interesting because like we're rather than seeing just like photos of people we're seeing like moving people and like them speaking and like we can hear their inflection and their voices and it's becoming like this really like great tool of communication and I don't know there's something really exciting about it to me um that like at the same time makes me question like the value of video art but also like makes me um, appreciate video art and like how video art can also just be, um, yeah, like with like, you know, there's so many different, um, facets of, of TikTok that like, we can learn so much about each other through it. Um, and so I don't know <laughs> if anyone else has anything else to say. I thought you were tired of social media. <laughs> I'm tired of posting about myself on social media. <laughs> Um, I'll just throw this in there with the TikTok conversation. Um, it is like a really great tool, uh, like an education tool. And it's like pretty amazing to see like Gen Z kind of run, run with it. Um, it kind of reminds me of back in the day. I don't know if anyone remembers Vine, but it's like Vine, but like, I don't know. It just seems like way more informed and like people are making TikToks about like um, radical theory, like, um, there's indigenous TikTok, there's like, I've seen like, so many sub genres that are things I would never imagine seeing, like, um, I know there's cartel TikTok, I've seen North Korea TikTok, um, just worlds that have opened up that like, you wouldn't normally see. So I think, again, it is a tool that, that I think is incredibly powerful. And it's as video art, it has like, a lot of a lot more reach um i think like and your people are like spreading this kind of information like very uh widely which i think is very interesting <clears throat> also like just a funny thing like vine is a really good way to like age yourself if you like accidentally say vine it's like people are like oh god like <laughs> you're old <laughs> i remember vine i'm proud of it <laughs> And, and it's like everyone forgot about Snapchat in between. It's like TikTok is the the, bait, the love child of Snapchat. And, but they're like, who's the daddy? Like, well. <laughs> I 
I think uh, to put it out there, I put it in the comments, thinking about the, the algorithm and the people in charge of TikTok of when people, when stuff gets to get flagged around, we do have to be conscious uh, and aware that half of the, the people working at TikTok are still white, right? So, and I've seen it, I've seen it happen a couple of times too, even on Instagram, right? Where like content is getting flagged by, by POC creators that are calling out whiteness, that are, that are doing X, Y, Z. Uh, and just uh, not being, you know, hurtful or violent in any way possible, but it gets flagged because uh, white users are flagging that as racist content. So um, I, I'm a pessimist at heart, so, so I'm sorry that I had to like, um, had to kind of like, yeah, TikTok is fun and great informational, but uh, also, in that conversation, we must not forget that people in charge of flagging stuff and shadow banning people are white still. And the content, if it doesn't um, please one white, um, I don't know what their job title would be, or one white supervisor who's who gets to look through uh, material that's flagged, right? Because we do see white supremacist ideology not being flagged, even though everybody POC is like it, it's not getting, it's not getting touched on, right? So definitely thinking about TikTok as a, as a tool in itself to combat um, white supremacy. Uh, it works, but it doesn't work. And it really is a challenge. If you really want to invest your time and self in making through TikTok, right? Um, if you want to waste your energy, definitely there is another layer of, of, I don't want to say, not, not gatekeeping, but of oppression or, or systematic positions that don't, that allow white creators to be on top of stuff versus by POC creators. I've seen it, like, it, it makes total sense when I'm like, like, that doesn't make sense. Uh, so, that's that's still a task that as as makers with new technology we have to keep account to or anytime where algorithm is 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 being made by white folks so just a thought i don't know if anyone has opinions on that or if the audience wants to uh chime in i feel like it's pretty much every social media platform though is that way like racist and the algorithms do not favor you know creators um who are speaking on these issues of white supremacy <clears throat> yeah i think that's maybe the advantage of us as like video artists is that um you know in one sense we have the 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 power to not censor ourselves and also um we have uh the power to maybe in some way like work outside of an algorithm um and so yeah, I agree with what everyone is saying, but um, maybe as like video artists, we have some advantage of, of not having to rely on an algorithm and more just like each other and our networks. Yeah, I have a thought on TikTok. I think that it could be a potential tool, um, but then I remember like two or one year ago, I'm not sure. I. I had a, a colleague in the MFA that he's like obsessed with algorithms and he was telling me like, yeah, this platform TikTok, but it's just really racist and all this like, like white folks are just making fun of like, oh, like this POC community, whatever. Um, and ironically, now I use it just to have fun. Just I see like mother videos and things like that, um, that, you know, just, just to, you know, kind of like have a laugh and things but not the racist thing but just like normal thing um but then I also wonder about like TikTok how you know it's a limited amount of video right and it also makes me think of how information is also passed because more and more people don't want to investigate people just like see something and they just acquire as a fact and I think that that's some of the issues with TikTok as well right we have a limited amount of time People are putting something in a platform that God knows if it's, you know, true. And a lot of people just say, okay, it's true. Um, 
so yeah, I think that maybe the question is about like, do we need to like just lure them in and you know make them want to research more, or are we just giving them all the information just there? So I don't know. Temporality is a big question, totally. Um, and it makes me think a little bit about this idea of knowledge making that that was kind of floating around or this, or, or you know, finding ways to resist and to see differently uh, or to reconnect to, to ourselves, the land, um, or to re-see things that have been mentioned before. Um, I, you know, I obviously, I'm biased in, in programming Sin Cinta Previa and working on this project. We, you know, we actually have one of our jurors who, who jumped in the chat. So this is a collaborative effort, right? And we all, there's something special about getting a batch of things from a bunch of different people from different perspectives and trying to, to force a connection or, or actually in ge genuinely seeing one and being surprised and, and, and pleased and happy that everything flows and connects in this way. Um, but that that you're all resisting in pretty different and special and like important ways, and that the medium of video is is affording a lot, um, whether it's durational and performative, whether it's um, animation, whether it's you know engaging these glitches or language or music, um, you know everybody's doing something pretty pretty unique and challenging the narrative, uh, the narratives that we've all been kind of handed down. In, in really important ways. So, so I do thank everybody for, for offering up of themselves and sharing, being vulnerable during this time, having this conversation. It's already about to push nine. We've been talking for a long time. Does anybody have any questions out there in Zoom land uh, before, we, before we retreat? Jump in, say something, shout outs, just say you love us. Give us some likes. We have a comment from Giselle, uh, who is one of the jurors, Giselle Miradias, uh, a good collaborator and thinker, um, uh, saying that is terrifying since youth aren't developing those skills to think critically and think about where the sources are coming from. Yeah, so definitely thinking about criticality when we're consuming these, uh, these content. So thank you so much, uh, Chris Pinter, uh, with the less than or greater than, less than three heart. <laughs> um, and if anyone has any other questions right now or comments about the artists, I think this would be a great time to, to ask them. Um, I don't know if the artists have any less comments or questions they wanna bring up to the table right now that we have uh, maybe a little bit more time to, to give space to, to what you guys are thinking. This will definitely be the time. Uh, uh, Simon asked what my book reference was, and it's The Undercommons by uh, Fred Moten and Steve Harney. I'll type it in the chat. Thank you. Yes. Uh, you know, we probably all need to share our reading lists with each other. <laughs> like, there's just so much there. You all ha are producing so much knowledge. I think that's what I was trying to say, and I might have lost the thread while I was speaking. But I was trying to say that everybody's producing knowledge in like really different and unique ways and resisting um, is it's, it's really great. And I appreciate your work so much. Yeah, definitely. So definitely follow if, if I don't know if this is the last goodbye. Uh, we have been talking for an hour and a half now. That if this is a, a good time for less comments, less questions. I don't know if the artist wants to say a couple of things before we all depart, or if the audience has any last questions. Um, yeah. Well, then I guess I'll just say thank you to everyone. Thanks out yeah, there. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you. See thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you guys for the comments. Yeah. Um, I will end the recording now. Okay. I guess we're, we're good. <laughs> Remember the surveillance, yeah. the all seeing eye was. Right. Surveillance. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, if you want